Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. We, um, we're going to look this morning at another parable of Jesus telling us what the kingdom of heaven is like. And uh, it seems that uh, from the gospel records that Jesus told parables pretty much right the way through his life. And, uh, but it seems to me that as he got to the end of his life, and we're looking at a parable in Matthew 22, so this is really the final week of his life. As he told parables during that period of his life, it seems to me that they became even more urgent and came across with greater clarity. And so we're looking at one of those uh, this morning, and Lulu's going to read for us. Let's just pray first. Father, thank you for your precious word. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 22, starting at verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find. The bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Thank you. Well, there's going to be a wedding. That's the parable that Jesus tells to tell us about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, this story, it seems to me, has it all. I mean, a few twists and turns, um, but there's wedding preparations, there's invitations going out, maybe a little bit of anxiety about who can come and who can, cannot. Uh, a dress code is specified, did you realise that? And there's even a wedding crasher, a, a gate crasher. So... What I'm going to try and do this morning is answer three questions with God's help. What does the parable mean? What was Jesus intending? Um, does the wedding garment incident spoil a good story? And where are you in Jesus' story? So what was Jesus' intention? Well, it's always important to try and ask this question when we're reading the Bible, and we're helped here by looking at who Jesus was speaking to. And if you look at the, the last verses of the previous chapter, you'll see that he is speaking to the chief priests and the Pharisees, the people who lead Israel, represent Israel. And it's interesting to note there that it says that they, as Jesus spoke to them, they knew that Jesus was talking about them and they didn't like what he was saying to them. And so Jesus, in the parable that we've just read, he, he speaks to them again. And he has good news and he has bad news for them. 
So first of all, the bad news, or it's really a warning. He's trying to help them to see what is going on. And uh, we see that in the parable, the king's invitation to the wedding has come first to them. It's come first to Israel, and they represent Israel, to the spiritual insiders, if you like, to the chosen ones. But you know, it's very unwise for any of us to assume that we know who is going to be at God's wedding banquet for sure. It's really unwise for us to sort of leap on and assume things. And I think it's likely that the chief priests and the Pharisees were undoubtedly assuming that they would be first to be invited, that they would probably have the best seats at the wedding banquet because of their position and so on. And yet the parable tells us they completely missed it and actually weren't at the banquet when it took place. Verse 3, the refusal to come to the royal banquet is the first sort of shocking turn in the story that Jesus tells. There must be some mistake. You know, maybe the invitations didn't get through. Surely they would come. Surely you would say yes to a royal invitation to a, to a, to a wedding. But we see there's, there's absolutely no mistake. Verse Verse 5, some paid absolutely no attention when the invitations went out again. They felt too busy. They felt too preoccupied. They were looking after their business. They were, you know, visiting their field and so on. And verse 6, others turn violent. They, they, They abuse and they actually kill the messengers. I mean, it's inconceivable, isn't it? These stories are meant to shock us. I mean, why would you kill a person who's delivering an invitation to a wedding? I mean, this is absolutely outrageous, the story that Jesus is telling. And we need to understand that this has been Israel's response historically. We read about that in the Old Testament. Often they rejected God's invitation right down to killing the prophets and eventually their Messiah himself. Isaiah, do you remember, wrote, and he said, you know, he was despised, speaking about the Messiah, he was despised and rejected. He was pushed away. Yet he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And Peter, when he was before the the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin in Acts 4, he speaks very pointedly to them. And he says, you know, this Jesus who has been crucified and now has risen, he is the stone that the builders of Israel rejected. Just goes straight in, telling them what's going on. And now Jesus, of course, is telling this parable to Israel's leaders a week before he is rejected and crucified. I mean, it's, the, the intensity of this is just growing in these stories that Jesus is, is telling. So in this parable, I mean, this has gone way beyond unacceptable behavior. <laughs> You, you, you know, the, the, the story is unimaginably shocking. Uh, th- th- there's now a dreadful crime which has been committed. And no wonder there is language of judgment in this story. Of course God the King will justly right the wrongs and remove everything where there's violence and hate and rejection, you know, in his domain, in his world, in his kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven. But now for the good news, and and what good news it is, it's verse 8, tells us a whole lot of the good news is that a whole lot of new people are going to be invited into the wedding, banquet, into the celebration. But you know, this second lot of invitations um, that go out to the streets and so on, it's not just a new guest list, it's like a whole new vision that Jesus is giving of what the kingdom of heaven on earth looks like how it's just totally different from the way that some of the horrors that happen in our world take place. And it is a vision of a table of welcome for everyone, absolutely everyone, from, um, for, for, from the people, from, the, from all the nations around the world. Verse 9, go out into the streets, you know, go to the wrong parts of town. Go to where ordinary people are and where poor people are and gather all of those. Um, Go to the ones who would never expect a royal invitation to a wedding Um, and invite all you can, both good and bad. I love that bit. 
In, you know, nobody's excluded. The good and, and the bad, verse 10. And it's symbolizing, isn't it? It's symbolizing the, the invitation of God going out to the Gentiles, going out to the nations, going out to the ends of the world, the last, the least, and the lost. They're all being invited. And they stream in, Jesus says, as he tells this, this story. You know, perhaps the gift of ordinary people on the streets is that they have a certain amount of space and time and awareness of their need that seems to have passed the others by. And so they accept the invitation at once when they are offered it. And this, of course, was the promise that God had given to Abraham, you know, right at the very beginning, back in Genesis chapter 12, that the whole world would be blessed through the one who came through Israel. And Isaiah, the great prophet, also saw it so, so clearly, where he says in Isaiah 49, 6, that, you know, it's too small a thing for God to simply bring back Israel. He's going to bring back the whole earth. He's going to go to the nations and bring the whole earth back. This is the good news. God is going large. He's including everybody in this invitation. And you know, this, the, the, this whole, the whole of God's story, do you see, is contained within this simple little parable that Jesus tells about a wedding banquet. It includes the, the Israel, it includes the Gentiles, it's, it's massive. And he's able to just bring it all together in this one simple story. Here's the second question. What is the wedding garment does the wedding garment spoil a good story? <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a you know, kind of a, a wrong footer in, in, the, uh, in the parable. Well, I'd have to answer that question by saying many think that it does. They, they dislike it because it doesn't teach what they want it to say, what they want Jesus to say. They want him to say that everyone is all right exactly the way that they are. They can come, you know, exactly the way they are and stay the way they are. But actually... This is the key, this element of the wedding garment is the key, the master stroke of the story. But it, it really requires us to, to have God's help and a softness in our heart, a humility in our heart to actually get him to show us how this is the key to the whole story. Who is this guy in verse 11? You know, he, he's not just some random wedding crasher who's wanting a free meal. That, that, that's not why Jesus has put him in. We've got to understand him as, a, as, as an intruder, a, a real intruder who, who assumes that he has the right to be there as he is. No sense of his need to be different, no realisation that he is completely unpresentable. He's filthy. I mean, we would say in spiritual terms, he's spiritually naked as though he's got, got no clothes on. It, it's just awful, awful. And so he pushes away the gift of the wedding garment that everybody is given as they come in to, to, to the gathering. The only thing, that wedding garment, the only thing that can make the foulest clean. Do you know, garments and robes uh, are, are kind of feature quite a lot in the pages of the Bible. And maybe that should alert us to the fact that this reference to a wedding garment here, it, you know, is important. Uh, not just to be passed by. I, I mean, think, for example, thinking of garments, I mean, right back in the Garden of Eden, where, where God uh, changes the holy inadequate clothes that Adam and Eve made for themselves out of fig leaves. He, he clothes them, we're told, in skins from an animal. That, that's a whole other story, that an animal had to die in order that they could be properly covered. It's talking about all kinds of things that Jesus does for us in, in the future. And think about the prodigal son, another example where he returns from the far country and, and the father, he exchanges, doesn't he? His filthy rags for this robe which the father gives him. And the wedding garment in the parable points us to the gift that only God can provide, which doesn't just 
cover and hide who we are and what we're like and what we've done and all of that. It doesn't simply cover it, but it actually purifies and cleanses and changes us from the inside out. It, it, it's putting on the life of the Lord Jesus, as the New Testament would say, so that we can be presentable and acceptable to him. You know, God's love reaches right to where we are. That's the wonderful truth. Reaches everyone right where they are, but his love refuses to let us stay the way we are. That's what this is saying. It trans you know, his love came to change us and to transform us and to heal us in ways so immense that it will take glory's heaven for us to even begin to get uh, an understanding of how immense this is. I'm sure you've probably had this, this op um, experience, but, you know, choosing a garment for a wedding, <laughs> you know, it, or, 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 or some special occasion, you know, can be tricky, can't it? Really tricky. Trying to judge by artificial light what, what the suit or the dress is going to look like in daylight. I mean, you know, what's it, what's it like? In the shop, it like, might look great, but get it outside, and it looks horrendous. And, and, and Jesus in this story is saying, you know, a day is coming, a wedding is coming, when a light of such brilliance will stream in upon us and upon the garment that we're wearing. And the only question that will matter at that time is whether our hearts are clothed in, in Jesus' life, in his wedding garment, that makes us absolutely acceptable and perfect in the sight of our heavenly Father, God the King. We're not getting dressed for the artificial light of this world. We're getting dressed for the light of the next, the brilliance of God in his purity shining upon us. So finally, where, where are you in the story? Where are you in the story? You know, how God wants us to find our place in this story and our seat at his table. What, I mean, what an inconceivable tragedy for those that reject and just push away and say, no, I, I don't want to be there. I'm giving up my seat at God the King's wedding banquet to find our seat and to experience his happiness. That's his greatest desire for any person, any person. And it's all about what we choose. That's what the parable is telling us. It's all about what we choose to do. One, reply to him. Reply to him. You know, we, we all get the invitation. Everyone gets the invitation. We were singing that, that wonderful worship song this morning about, you know, he loves us all the same. That's not the question. He loves us all the same, whether you're a believer or a hater or a doubter or, a, or broken. He loves us all the same. We all get the invitation. The point is, have you replied? Have you replied to the invitation? It, it's got an RSVP on it. <laughs> you know, we have to put pen to paper. We have to message back. We have to text back. We have to get in touch with the king, God the king, and tell him, yes. We've made a commitment. We want to be at the wedding banquet. <laughs> we really want to be there. Count us in. Count us in. Reply soon, very politely. <laughs> RSVP. Secondly, receive his gift. Put, put, put on the wedding garment that Jesus gives us, provides for us as gift. It's a gift. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to hire it from Moss Bros or someplace like that. It, do, do, do you see that there's something incredibly powerful here? No one, back to the, the, the invitation to the good and the bad, you know, no one is too bad to be invited. Do you understand that? No one is too bad to be invited. doesn't matter what people have done, any of us have done. But no one is too good not to need to put on the gift of his wedding garment. Put it on now. Put it on daily. I mean, most of it, all of us, I hope, you know, get dressed every day in our clothes. You know, that, that makes sense. 
well, you know, how much more important it is to clothe ourselves in this garment morning, noon, and night because it makes us acceptable, makes us acceptable. We're able to, to move in this world and the next and be seen as like the Lord Jesus. Um, and three, be ready. <laughs> be ready. You know, this wedding banquet could happen at any moment. Could happen at any moment. And the best way that Jesus goes on in this uh, gospel to tell us that we can be ready for the wedding banquet is by simply doing each day what he has given you to do. It's not complicated, but just to live for him and to do what he's given you to do. Not, not, not what he's given someone else to do, given you to do. Love your family. You know, bless your neighbors. Care for your friends. Forgive your enemies. And to all of them, without exception, give. Give his invitation. Give his welcome and give his hospitality. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Just as we're here together, Lord, and uh, as we're in our different places, watching online, listening online, Lord, be with us. Lord, come with your spirit. Present yourself. And I do have a, a real sense that it's time for some to reply to that invitation. You know, it's time to actually send it back. It's been sitting on the mantelpiece, maybe the invitation. Now it's time to send it back for some. And here's, here's a prayer that just enables you to reply to God the King, if that's where you're at and ready to do. Lord, I am sorry that I have often felt too busy, too preoccupied to respond to you. I've maybe known about your invitation, I've heard about your invitation, but I've never actually responded, never sent it back to you personally, heart to heart, from me to you, telling you that I want to be there at the banquet. Lord, I pray, wash me. Make me clean on the inside. Thank you that the gift that you give as you put your robe, this garment on me, Lord, you're, you're, you're cleaning me from the inside out as well. And every time I mess up, Lord, as I turn back to you and ask for your forgiveness, you wash me again. Thank you, Lord, for that. Come and by your Spirit, dwell within me, fill me, clothe me in your gift. Thank you, thank you, thank you.